Sushimika. C'è qualcuno là fuori? C'è qualcuno là fuori? Benvenuti al Christian Podcast. Oh, no, no, no. This is a radio. That's right, my friends. How are you guys doing today? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Won't you be mine? Would you be my neighbor? You guys know me. I'm Beto Gudinho or the avatar of Beto Gudinho because the real Beto Gudinho is drinking coffee at his favorite coffee shop here in Costa Mesa, which I won't tell you which one it is. Uh, but one day, come find out or ask me on my Instagram or whatever you want. I'll tell you what my favorite one is. And today, we're going to be talking about this topic of what is adulting. That, that gap between the years when you're a young person and then you're not. You're not a young adult anymore. You're an adult adult. And for that, we're going to have an expert in this topic a person who has gone through the years from being a young person to being an adult, right? And it's not me. It's a guest that we have today that I'm about to introduce to you guys. And she wrote this book called The Gap Decade. When you're technically an adult but really don't feel like it. And I'm going to ask a few questions that maybe as you're listening, you're like, I can relate to that. When have you walked through a hard season of waiting? Have you ever walked through a hard season of, day, of waiting? What do you do when you're waiting for something that doesn't show up as quickly as you thought or as you wish it would have shown up? How do you cope? Have you ever had to make a big career or life change? What prompted that and what gave you the strength to make the leap well these and many many more questions we're about to discover today with katie schnack and i hope i'm saying it right katie how are you doing today are you there i'm i'm doing good yes and you are saying it just fine it's the it's a very strange last name so yes you did perfect so thank you love it i mean katie schnack to me sounds like snack and i like that part I know half of my family, um, I married into the name, half of my family does say snack, like literally pretzels. <laughs> But I refuse. I'm like, if there's a CH, I will be saying the CH. Like, I'm not making it silent. So it's snack. Snack. I love it. And you know what? My name is Umberto. But the H is silent in Spanish, so it doesn't matter if it's there or not. That's true. But in English, it does. So people say Humberto. Yeah. Exactly. Which sounds yeah. totally weird, so that's why I say, just call me Beto. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that works too. Katie, welcome to the show. I'm so happy and excited to have you on. And first of all, I want to read a little bit of who you are and what you do, but then you can corroborate or say whether that's accurate or not. But okay. Katie Schnack is a writer and book publicist. Her articles have appeared in places such as Relevant, Today.com, Hello Giggles, And of course, the Christian podcast. Well, not an article, but your episode with us. Yes. And I love this part. Uh, you grew up in Minnesota playing duck, duck, gray duck. You learned to say, bless your heart in Texas. That was really good. <laughs> right? That was really good. Uh, I learned that from you and from listening to, to your book. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. lived in a 400 square foot apartment in New York. I used to. You still you lived. There. Yeah, okay. Jersey City, actually. But it was close right. enough to Manhattan. I've never been to New York, so to me, it's all the same. Um, right. And you have a love-hate relationship with Cheetos. Is that accurate, Katie? Is that how you you portray yeah. yourself? Absolutely. I mean, yes. It's, <laughs> it's a very creative bio, but there it is, and it does mention Cheetos in it. And yes, I have a love-hate relationship with them. I love them and I hate them, but mostly love them. So, yeah. <laughs> That's so great. Katie, well, I have, look, I'm, I have so many questions as I was listening and reading to your book. But first of all, I want to start right here because, I mean, I have your book in my hands right here, The Gap Decade. 
And I do tend to judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. And when I saw this, I'm like, I love it. You know, it's so colorful. But then the title and the subtitle just got my attention right away. You're, when you're technically an adult, but really don't feel like it yet. And I feel mm -hmm. like, wow, I'm, well, I'm going to tell you right now and people know, but I'm 40. So I'm, I'm past the, the 30 year old right. decade. And I feel like, am I an adult yet? I'm still asking this question, right? And as I was reading your book, I'm like, okay, I'm not the only one, but let's hear it from Katie. So, I mean, first of all, tell me a little about your book. Like, what is the goal with your book? Like, who did you write it for? And I love the book. Like, anything about the book, just tell me about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, I wrote it, like, for me, it's um, a lot of my stories um, post-college through when my husband and I had our first baby. And that, for us, was kind of that very transformative decade, right? Um, do I feel 100% like an adult now? Not always. And like you said, at 40, you don't really either. Um, but I wanted to write it because I feel like so many people, and it's been so cool to see after the book has come out that it's just confirmed it to me that so many people struggle during this season um, with just being like, I, am I doing this right? Like, is this normal? Should I be feeling this and thinking this? Um, about a lot of different things. Um, and like you said, even at 40, you're still kind of going through that, like, just trying to figure out like, is this, is this it? Like, is this adulthood? Is this what it feels like to be grown up? Um, so I just wanted to look back on what I had learned through my decade in the past. And then also just kind of, I don't know, share some really funny stories, but kind of just really start some conversations with people about things that that are hard and transitional and tricky during this season. Um, but then also just help them laugh a little bit at themselves and their own experiences along the way too. Wow. And you did it so well. I mean, the book is funny and I mean, sometimes you even, you, you're talking about like hard stuff and then you switch, <laughs> you know, to, know. to something <laughs> super funny. I know. Right. So, but, but I love your humor and I love your, your perspective on life. I think it's Thank so you. helpful. And I mean, I was asking some questions at the beginning, right? When when people are going through this phase of like, uh, what am I, right? So I was thinking about this and I wrote it right here. What do you think about this? When you're a teen, you don't care how things will pan out. Mm -hmm. When you're 20, you don't know how things will pan out. But when you're 30, things have panned out. Is that, is that kind of like what you experienced through through your life? I love that. That's like a really good way to kind of put it together. Because when you're a teen, you're so focused on like, what am I doing this Friday night, right? Um, and when you're in your 20s, you're like, what is going to happen with my life? Like, will I ever meet someone or have a home or a job or whatever? And then when you're in your 30s, and I mean, I think it's definitely different for everybody, right? Like how things evolve during our lives. But I know that in my 30s, I do feel like a little bit more like, okay, like I don't have all the answers by any means, but like I feel more sure of where I'm at and where I'm going. And honestly, it's awesome. And I'm grateful to be in that season. Um, but I do think that, again, it's so helpful to look back and kind of just reflect on what you know, that kind of crazy transitional 20 season brought about um, because there's so many people that are still walking through those seasons now. So that's why, I, again, just kind of bringing the conversations to light because I think they're important and they're so universal. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good. And I mean, I, I, I love the stories in the book. And I mean, you're you're very open and honest and you kind of tell what, what you face through life. So I feel I mean, I feel a little confident to ask you a few questions that, you know, might be might be hard or not. But um, yeah, no, ask away. I'm a, I'm an o it's literally an open book, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's fine. Exactly. Just, uh, yeah. Go. No, everything's on the table. I just feel like when I've heard people be so honest about stories, especially like hard things, whatever, like I felt so comforted. So it's my little way of like giving back to the world. I'm like, well, here's my story. So. OK, because I see. I see for the most part, I mean, you're one of the main characters in this story, right? You're narrating a little bit of a lot of what you've been through in your mm -hmm. life and in these different seasons of your life. And I think, you know, people that are key to your life have been, I mean, of course, family, parents, um, right? But a guy named Kyle. Yeah. So let's talk about that. I mean, because he uh, comes 
all the time throughout your book. So let's talk about who's Kyle. <laughs> who's Kyle? Just a little guy named Kyle. Yeah, no, Kyle's my husband. And we I start the book opening up about our little like origin story, how we met when we were 12. And we literally, it's so weird, but we were basically together ever since that day that we met when we were 12 years old give or take a few rocky seasons. Um, but yeah, he's, it's been so interesting. And I know that a lot of people who are in their twenties and thirties and in their gap decade and beyond are still struggling, um, with finding their person and, you know, kind of wanting to find a spouse. Um, that just wasn't part of my story, but I totally empathize with that. Um, but what it has been interesting to see is that Kyle and I have had to grow up together and what that kind of brings um, in a marriage and the challenges that that can kind of bring and the and the benefits as well. But yeah, we got engaged when we were 19, married when we were 21, and we've been, you know, just kind of going through our gap decade together um, ever since. And so it's been one of my biggest blessings by far in my life, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's so interesting when, when I read about You know, Kyle and you meeting at 12. I mean, I have a, a boy, like a, my oldest one is 12. And when I know, I think, isn't that weird? I have friends whose kids are 12 now. And I was like, they're 12. I was like, that's how old I was. It's like, it's so little. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. A part of me when I was reading the book is like, where are, where were Katie's parents during those times? Like, I mean, were, how, I mean, were your parents like pretty free spirit or How did oh, that work no. out? I mean, my parents, I always say they love Kyle more than they love me. Like he was wow. like at my house. My mom was like feeding him broccoli, like feeding him dinner. Like he basically, I mean, like when you're dating, when you're 12, it's like, you know, but like all through high school, it was of course more serious, but my parents, they love him. So he's basically like their little, their little son. So at this point. Yeah, that's so good. And I mean, I love this other, uh, just the fact that you grew up in Minnesota And mm -hmm. I've been to Minnesota a few times. I had a, a great friend from Minnesota. You know, back in, in my gap decade years, I would say. <laughs> and yeah. I would go there and visit. And I mean, phenomenal state. So beautiful trees, uh, lakes. Right. So beautiful. And, you know, just kind of like to take it back a little bit. When I was in high school, my teacher that taught me English mm -hmm. was from Minnesota, too. And you know, it's oh. funny because she came to to Mexico to teach uh, wow. English. And then yeah. she married my computer teacher. <laughs> in Mexico? Yes, in Mexico. That's and awesome. I, I think they've been living there ever since. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. So I just hope that because she literally taught you English that you picked up some of the Minnesota accent from her because it's a solid accent. <laughs> it's it's really funny. So. Yeah, it, it's hard because at this point, I don't, well, I, I would say, Back then, I wouldn't, I couldn't even tell the difference no. in accents no. from people. So yeah, it's taken me years and years and years. But uh, I love that part, you know, about you know the connection growing up in Minnesota. So tell me a little bit about, you know, before we go into a little more heavy stuff, but mm -hmm. about your your aspirations and dreams when you were growing up. Uh, like you talk about working for a, like a news. Um, mm -hmm. station and even you know like this this time when Michael Jackson died yes. and you know this moment of tension like hey pull up the video pull up the video and you had to go like look it up tell me a little bit about those like what was going through your mind when when you were you know in that stage of your life of hey I have a job it's a cool job I, I actually like it but how did it yeah. feel Yeah, you know, um, when I was in college, I did want to do um, TV journalism, and I did end up getting a, like, low-level job at a TV station right after I graduated, which was wonderful. It was right before the crash really hit, um, so I got lucky and just had a job, which I was really grateful about. Um, and, yeah, I was there when Michael Jackson died, and I had to run and find the videotape, and I had no idea where the video room was, and it was crazy. Like, when you're in TV news, it's so funny because your deadlines are, like, in 30 seconds from now you're like okay you need to be done in 30 seconds you're like oh that's easy like no big deal um but as I worked there and I talk about that a lot in the early chapters of the gap decade I realized that it just wasn't what I wanted to do with my life and that's why I wanted to kind of um include that because I think that happens to so many people right like they go all in on something like I literally got a college degree in broadcast journalism I literally got the job I was doing the thing and then I was sitting there and I was like great, but I don't like it, right? And so I think that it's okay to have those moments where you do a 180 and you change your course. Um, is it easy? No. Is it scary? Yes. Um, but I think that like for me, I just really felt in my heart that I had 
a choice. Like I could have taken the easier path to kind of continue in news and just because I felt like it was safe um, or I could kind of step out and see what else God had for me. And that's what I ended up doing. Um, So yeah, I think that a lot of people in the gap decade, like I wanted to include a section about careers because it's such a huge part, right, of this season, just figuring out like what you want to do for work, um, what you want to do for, I don't know, everything. And so yeah, so it was in the TV news, and then I decided that it wasn't for me, and I just kind of took the leap and kind of tried to pursue more writing and publishing instead. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, um, I mean, you have a husband, too, who's also pursuing his own aspirations and hopes and dreams. And, I mean, you guys got married super young, right? I mean, I think you were in, in college, and you're married, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine, but uh, how did you – how did how did the relationship with him affect like what kind of career change you were willing to make and the decisions you wanted to change, uh, to take for your own, no career loving or your own, no career change, but knowing that, no, maybe, no, your husband, Kyle also wanted to pursue this other thing and maybe moving out of state, like things like that. How do you wrestle or how did you wrestle with that tension, uh, back in those days? Yeah, that's a really good question because that's one of the main things, right? Like if you're single, like you can go move wherever, do whatever, or like work a million hours, you know, but if you're in a relationship, like it's not, you have to give and take with the other person. Um, And so Kyle, right after um, undergrad, did want to go to grad school for acting and he did. And so luckily for me, like I've always kind of wanted to, and this was like early on before we moved a million times, but I always kind of wanted to like move to a new state in a new city and be like, let's just go and start fresh. It'll be like an adventure. Um, And so I was all okay with it. I was all in. And um, the other thing with being so young too and being married is like, you have a little bit of time to kind of, you know, figure out now we're like in our thirties, we have two kids. Like we can't, it's not as easy to just be like, oh, let's just change our whole lives tomorrow. But we did have that opportunity. Um, so I was happy to kind of go and see um, where we were going to end up and kind of just see where God was going to take us. Um, and then too, like at that same time, like even though we were like kind of going around the country for his jobs or for grad school, he the main thing is he was always so supportive of what I was working on too. And I think that is so important. So it's always just a balance, right? Like, yes, like, maybe for a season, like we were in Austin, Texas for his graduate program. Um, but then like now he's like doing a little more things to support like my book publishing. So it's kind of like a give and take. And I think like if you can just support each other through wherever God is taking you in your creative endeavors, it's, you know, eventually you'll both get where you need to be. Yeah. It's, it's almost like Mr. Miyagi would say, right? Daniel San, (laughs) you need to find balance. You need to find balance in life. (laughs) Yes. Wow, look at those sound effects. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Love it. So um, you are making career changes. Mm-hmm. You are married. But then you also open up uh, the book with, uh, with a story about having a friend, right? Like mm-hmm. Jenna. So tell me a little bit about how this went about. Because, I, I mean, there's, there's tragedy later on. But first, I mean, who's Jenna? And, mm-hmm. you know, what's your relationship to her in your early, early days as a yeah, teen? I love that. I love being able to talk about her. So thank you. Um, so a lot of people, when they go to college, they meet a friend, right? And you get very close with them because it's like you're waking up, eating, like drinking, sleeping. Like it's like you're living with this person and then like enjoying the weekends and doing all the fun things too. Um, so you get close really quickly. So Jenna was my friend um, that we had that relationship with. And it was so wonderful just to like go to a new college out of state and just connect with somebody like that. Um, I know now that friendships like that are, they're not always a guarantee and they're rare. And so, you know, they're special. Um, so what happened was we went, um, college with the best freshman year we were going to be roommates sophomore year um and she was in a car accident the day after like a couple hours after we hugged goodbye for the summer and she died um so what that did was just like shatter everything I ever knew about God about my faith about everything at I was 19 years old right and I just I literally had to kind of like really examine what I felt and believed about God and about a lot of things Um, when faced with such tragedy at such a young age. So yeah, that was it. And I mean, um, it was, I think about her all the time. And I think about 
that moment because sometimes when really tough things happen to you, um, you're different. It's obviously very hard, but you're also different in a good way too. Like I never take things for granted. And I feel like because I knew her and because I loved her and I had that loss, the rest of my life, I kind of felt like um, I can really just kind of go all in on things um, because honestly, she didn't have the opportunity. So. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, when, when you talk about Jenna and it's a little bit towards the end of, on the book, but you, you talk about almost like this unhelpful uh, voices that come up, you know, when somebody dies and even, you know, as you're saying, you know, you're wrestling with your faith, you're wrestling with who God is and who, who God is in your life and why do bad things happen, right, to, to good people, that, that type of questioning. And, and then on top of that, like these other voices start coming in. So tell me a little bit about these unhelpful voices. Like how do we, just, even coming from, from maybe people with good intentions, right? But to, I think it's important for people to learn that sometimes when people are going through seasons of, of grieving, yes. Uh, yes. that there are, there are phrases that are just not helpful, right? So yes, tell absolutely. me a little bit about that. Yeah, and that was something because so Jen and I, we went to a very amazing, wonderful um, Christian college and it was awesome. Like so many people go there because they are believers and and it's on the beach, to be quite honest. And so and it was just great. Um, but with that, um, you get a lot of I call it Christianese, which is like kind of like cheesy Christian sayings that people just throw at you um, after difficult times. And as the older I've gotten, the more I've realized, like, that's not necessarily true. Um, the main thing that I really struggled with, and I think so many people can relate to after they go through a tragedy, is when people say, oh, everything happens for a reason. And, like, do I believe that God has a greater plan for everything that happens in our lives? Yes, because he does say that in Scripture, and it's, you know. But the thing is, like, after Jenna died, I was looking for the reason, right? I was looking, like, okay, what here on earth would make, a, like, be so great that it, like, it justifies her dying? Mm -hmm. um, it justifies so many people having a huge hole in their hearts because she's not with us here. And I couldn't see anything. And so that made me feel like, like, maybe I don't have enough faith. Like, maybe I'm just, you know, like, I was like, but like, I miss her. And so many people are heartbroken over this. Like, I don't see anything happening. That's, oh, that's why that happened. Happened. Um, so there was one day when I was driving with her childhood best friend to a little event and I was talking about that. I was like, I hate it when people say everything would happen for a reason um, because I just don't see the reason. And my friend Lauren, she said to me, and it really helped. She said, um, yes, we believe that everything does happen for a reason, but we're not promised. We're going to know that reason this side of heaven, right? Like we're not like, do I believe that even hard things, you know, work together for a greater plan? Yes. And will I know what that plan is? one month after the hard thing happens? No, I'll probably never know. Um, but what I do is like, I genuinely do trust God and that he has a good plan for all of us. Um, even when things are really difficult and that's what I cling to now. And just knowing that you don't need to know the answers now, like maybe we'll know in heaven, maybe we won't, I don't know, but I don't know that just kind of freed something in me. because I think that so many people, especially people of faith, they try to find like justification for their pain but then when they don't find it then they feel guilty about it and so just like kind of freeing that for me like I don't know why this happened frankly it sucks one like it just does um and I don't know if I'll ever know um but what I did kind of focus on too like where I really did start to like heal and feel like you know close to God again was like I was able to have joy and peace after such a tragedy and I think that is like a miracle from God in itself So. Mm, wow. Yeah. And what would you be, what would you think it's, it's a more helpful um, way for like, just kind of like try to educate people that might be f facing similar situations. What would be a more, or what, what do you wish people would have done instead? You know, instead of coming with these phrases like, oh, everything happens for a re reason. What would you have? Wow. My English is getting mixed up right here but what were the words that you hoped you would have heard you know what I love that question and it's something that at the time I didn't realize I needed um but after just going like after suffering such a loss um 
and kind of walking through that season of grief afterwards. Um, and my long guy is here. Sorry. Can you hear him? <laughs> um, what I wish, honestly, that people would say is sometimes nothing. Like sometimes I wish, like the times where I have felt the most comforted by people, it's when they didn't try to explain away my pain or explain away my hurt or my depression or my anxiety when they just were like, man, like that's hard and that sucks and I'm here for you. Um, because sometimes it's like, like I said, there isn't really a reason here on earth that we can see why things are hard or why we feel a certain way. Um, but we can just like be there for people physically. Um, and you know, and just like being like, I'm here for you. I'm with you. I'm listening to you. And for me, like after that, and in other difficult times of my life, that kind of seemed to be a lot more comforting than any little like cliche saying that you would see on a sign at Hobby Lobby. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's super helpful. And I mean, we're talking about almost like these seasons in life, right? So we're, we're talking about, you know, career, Uh, changes, career decisions, uh, you know, getting married, having a, you know, a, a spouse and you no know, financial commitments. You even talk about taxes in the book and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, you know, like, like life happening, right? Like tragedy happening. I mean, it's, uh, it's guaranteed that everyone here on this planet will die, right? That's, that's one thing we all know. We don't know when, and that's the hard part that sometimes, you know, it surprises us. But, I mean, as you move on, I would love to, I mean, one, in the book, you said that Kyle, who I think at that point was uh, um, off to college somewhere else, like he yeah. came when your friend Jenna died, he mm -hmm. came to the, you know, to the funeral and kind of like to, to be with you. So tell me a little bit about that, because I think that's, I mean, as a guy, I'm like, wow, I admire that. And I think it's, uh, it, it inspires me, you know, and I feel like it can inspire people, but Um, what did that mean for you when Kyle shows up to mm -hmm. this hard time in your life? You know, that is such a wonderful question. And it's such a nice thing to kind of reflect on. Um, and I, it kind of ties into your last question too, because basically like the backstory, the deets, the nitty gritty is like Kyle and I were broken up technically freshman year and there was no FaceTime. There was no like anything like that, which seems so archaic now. Right. Um, so, you know, we were broken up and it was difficult Um, and I, I broke up with him to be honest. And so, and I know that was hard for him and it was just a hard season, but like the day she died and I flew home to Minnesota and my parents flew me home, he was there at the airport just to greet me. And it meant everything. And I think what it is, is like Kyle and of course like family and there's people in your life that like, you realize that no matter what happens, like they're going to be there. Right. And I think that like, it's crazy that Kyle was one of those people that I met so early in life. And I do feel like it's such a blessing. Um, but he was just there. And then how it goes back to my last, our last question is I think of like that summer, um, when he, I was a mess, like just a big old mess from losing my best friend. He didn't say anything. Like he just was there with me. We would watch movies. He bought me a kitten, which was kind of fun, but like, you know what I mean? Like, just like things like that. Like, He didn't try to like tell me like you need to do this 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 and you know you know god is doing this 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 he just was there and i think there's something significant in that right like in that moment of grief just being there with the people that are going through it and i mean maybe buy them a kitten like that might help <laughs> like, you know what i mean but maybe not um but i don't know so yeah he was just there and i'll i mean i'll never i mean obviously of course i'll never forget it mm -hmm. yeah and you didn't forget because you ended up marrying Kyle, right? And I, I mean, that's that's such a cool story, you know. And then, you know, you you guys made the choice because of his career to to go live in New York. So tell me about this time because, I mean, one thing like for like I was saying at the beginning, I've never been to New York. All I know is, I mean, it's big, epic city, right? We see it in the movies all the time. Um, so mm -hmm. tell me a bit, of, tell me a little bit about that experience. Because in the book, you say you live in a 400 square foot apartment. I mean, uh, how was that? I mean, just elaborate on what that felt like living with another person in such a tight space. So um, in the book, you guys kind of get a really, that chapter specifically where we talk about moving to New York and living in such a small space is where we get really honest about like, hey, like even though we've been together 
forever, it feels like, it's really hard still. Like, you don't get sheltered from that just because you've known each other since you're a child. Like, it gets messy, and it gets not great, and it gets a little bit yucky sometimes. So um, moving to New York was amazing in a lot of ways. Like, we both were really excited about it. Um, it was like kind of that adventure that, you know, you have at that season of your life. And I'm so grateful that we did it. Um, the only apartment we could afford was 400 square feet. And it was in Jersey City because we couldn't even afford Queens, which is like, you know, that was like the cheapest borough. So we went to like the next borough. Um, but it was just little apartment. And for the first time, like he was kind of working from home a lot and he would go into the city for auditions and I was working from home. So not only were we living in 400 square feet, but we were working and living. And it's kind of funny now with COVID because I feel like so many people have had that experience with their spouse, right? By the, over the last year or so, because you have to be living and working and all the things and parenting. Um, but we were just, we just did it, you know, years ago, but it was, it was like, it was for the first time in our life, we realized that sometimes in relationships, you need a little bit of space. Um, you need a little bit of like separation to be able to like coexist in a healthy way. And so we kind of just had to work that out. Um, but it was, it was challenging. And I think it's like when any season, like if you move to a place or if there's a pandemic and you're forced to live and work and parent and be together 24 hours a day, it's, it's an adjustment. Um, so we definitely, we definitely saw that, but we kind of figured out, figured out the balance. Like you said, if you want to play that balance thing again, but <laughs> there we go. Balance. <laughs> um, that's so great. And, you know, as a, I, I remember back in the days when, you know, my pastor in Mexico was mm -hmm. teaching about, you know, couples getting married and things like that. It's like, you don't know once you get married, I mean, something like squeezing the toothpaste the oh. wrong way is going to oh cause problems, right? I'm like, nah, that's never going to happen. And guess oh. what? The the toothpaste thing never happened, but the blinds open in the morning, right? right? The blinds should be shut. Why are they open? <laughs> I like the sunshine. No, there, it's in my face. I can't see anything, right? <laughs> and just little things go. like that. I mean, did you experience yeah. anything like that? Oh my gosh, I think I literally put in the book that I don't know if I did or maybe it was another essay that I wrote, but like literally now we have separate tubes of toothpaste because like wow. we could not function on the same one. And it's my fault because I'm a little bit out there and a little bit ED and all over the place. So like I always lose a toothpaste cap. I always have like just like toothpaste everywhere. And his toothpaste is like a nice little neatly rolled up tube. And so he's like, your toothpaste is disgusting. I was like, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to fix it. It's just my brain. And so now we have separate tubes. And you know what? Maybe that's just what people need, right? Sometimes, <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe you need an eye mask so the sun <laughs> doesn't bother you in the morning. Yeah. No, that's my wife. I like the sun. Oh, you, know, you she, like the sun. Okay, yeah. She's, yeah, <laughs> she's yeah. the one that's like, hey, I don't like the sun so bright in my face, especially in the morning <laughs> when it's rising up. But it's so good. I mean, it, yeah, it, it does come to, like, the little things, right? It's whatever. But I mean, even even as we talk about this, um, the little things, but sometimes it's also, I mean, I've heard this from many pastors and many you know, people giving counsel. It's always uh, money that has a play in a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And I know as you were mentioning, you know, living in New York and how things get expensive and then, you know, doing your own taxes, right? In the season of your life, like we can do this, right? Let's figure out like TurboTax or whatever it's called. So yeah. tell me a little bit about that, that money relationship in, in a married uh, life, but also yeah. just in, in the gap decade, right? Money is important. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to include that because it's not, you know, people don't normally write like a book of essays and stories and they're like, and let's talk about money and taxes too but I did because like during this season it's such a huge it's a huge part of your life no matter how you swing it it just is and I think it's so interesting because once you graduate college or high school or whatever your path is it's like you're just expected to know how to do that all well like how to budget and how to like you know do your taxes and figure that all out and it's just not something that anybody ever really teaches you um so it comes with like a learning curve right like it takes a while to kind of figure that out um so that's definitely what happened for us. Like in New York, I write like specifically in that chapter you're mentioning, I write about how like money was tight, like it never had been before for us. And I think that, you know, 
that puts a whole different stress on a marriage, like even more than the toothpaste tube and all of that. Um, and it's hard. And like, we were literally at a point where we were just trusting God, like, okay, God, like we're here. You called us here. Like, please just help us not go completely broke. Um, you know, and just, just did the best we could with that in that season. And I don't know, like, I think it's one of those times where like, sometimes everything's kind of physical and tangible that you use as a comfort is taken away from you. So like, what do you have left? And it's just your faith. And so we just really had to be like, lean on God in that moment and try not to freak out in like the day to day in the meantime with worry and anxiety. Um, But yeah, too. And then like for taxes, I wanted to talk about that because I feel like 20s, 30s and beyond, it's still, they're just the worst. And it kind of reflects more in like the bigger story of like taxes are gross but like, there's a lot of gross things that you have to do as you become an adult that keep coming no matter what happens, right? Like year after year, you're going to have to pay taxes or figure out health insurance. And so like, what do we do with that? And I'm like constantly fighting for a way to like, not let it dominate my mental, like happiness. Um, so in here, I wrote about like how, when we were in New York city, we were so sick of like having the worst tax day of our life. So we like ordered pizza and played music and put on like candles and just like made it feel like more fun. Um, and it helped. And so I think that there's like a little bit of an element of like, when you have to go through hard things, doing like tiny little things to make them a little bit more bearable and even a little bit more beautiful. Um, it just can help. Mm, Yeah. So good. And I love when you say, you know, like when it came down, all we had was our faith and you know, there's, uh, you mentioned this, I think two times that you made a, a three word prayer. And when you're in New York, I mean, you kind of had like this this short and a little bit desperate prayer, right? But tell me a little bit about that that moment when, because I, I think people can relate. Like, is God even like listening to me? Is God even answering my prayers? Like, and tell me about th- that moment when you're in New York and you went to this place and prayed. Oh, the moment we were walking and fighting and all of that. There's that. Well, there was a moment too where like, um, New York was great, but it's hard. And I think anybody that lives there knows that like there's, it's really fun, but it also is really challenging. And, um, Kyle just wasn't really happy with being there. And I was honestly kind of leaning into the struggle too. It was just very challenging with finances and everything. And so, um, I, it gets to a point where things are like so out of your hands and out of control. You're like, I don't even know what to pray for. Like, I don't even know what would fix this situation because nothing that I can see or know with like my eyes would fix it. Like I have no solution. So like, there's times in my life like that in New York where I'm just like, God, please help. And like, I just prayed over, I'm like, just help. And I don't know how, but like, please help. Um, And sometimes I think that like those small, like desperate prayers, like, you know, God hears them and answers them. He hears all of our prayers. But I think that like, sometimes if you feel like you don't even know what to pray for, you can still pray, right? And just kind of like see, you know, because in those moments, I always feel like where you're at the end of what you can physically do to help your life or improve your life, that's when God, when you ask, kind of like can come in and open a door that you have never even knew existed, right? Um, and it's awesome. And so that's when we've gotten to those moments, like I always just pray that like, God, just please help and just kind of see what he does next, because that's all I got to offer at that moment. <laughs> so yeah, and I think you were saying um, that um, some doors open for you to move to Memphis, After you made like a short prayer and then, you know, I think Kyle got a phone call. Yeah, that was one of those moments that like, it's so wild. It's like when you experience something like that in your life where you're like, there's literally no way to deny that that was like miraculous in a way and from the Lord because like the timing is just so wild, right? And like, it can be in such small moments in your life. Um, like you pray to see like a blue bird and like a blue bird pops up or like whatever, but, or it can be big like this. And so we were walking to church and I love this chapter because we were fighting on the way to church and I don't know if you ever fight with your wife on the way to church, but it happens, right? Never, (laughs) never. never, Right. I don't know what it is. And I say in there, I'm like, is this like the devil? Like, why is he? Cause like, why? I don't know. We always fight before in church, but anyway, so we were like fighting on the way to church and I was like. I didn't know how to fix it. And I didn't know how to fix like our situation in New York. And we were both like really struggling. And so I was just literally praying. I finally was able to shut my mouth on the sidewalk and stop yapping and just start praying like, God, please help us. Like just help us. I don't know how, I don't know what, whatever. So we went to church 
and we came out of that church service and he had a voicemail on his phone and it was from a job in Memphis, Tennessee that he basically forgot he had even applied for. Um, literally, like we went from being like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like this is not working for us. And me just being like, God help us. And then like an hour later after church service, there was like, boop, right on his phone. So it was really cool. And Memphis ended up being one of the best blessings of our life. We have never thought we would go to Memphis, Tennessee. I had to Google where it was. I didn't even know. Um, but it was such, such a blessing um, and such a beautiful, beautiful place to live. So, yep. Cause sometimes, sometimes really crazy doors are opened up <laughs> yeah. for sure. That's yeah. so good. Yeah. And I mean, my, my, my main goal is a little bit of this, uh, you know, to kind of like inspire people to, to pay attention to those moments, right. Where, I mean, situations might come up, things might get hard and almost like this, this sense of like, don't lose hope, you know, like continue to pray, like continue to believe that things can get better. I think that's essential. And I mean, in your book, you talk about so many things that, uh, I mean, that we face right in this, in this gap decade, or even in life, just in general. Right. But I mean, you talk about friendship, you talk about, you know, making new friends, like moving to different states and how did you how do you start a new community right in these places and then move to the next season of your life and maybe in a different state and you know what happens to those relationships you need to start again and sometimes that's um it's not easy right like i come from from mexico i lived there 24 years of my life and then i come to the u.s and it's taken me literally years to get adjusted to like a new life and also to start making even new relationships that i i can start calling friends right When in Mexico, I have friends like you know, left and right. And here's like, oh, who's my friend? Like, and I can, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for, for your story and just people going through these phases, you know, where, where it's like, man, sometimes I feel alone. I feel like, I mean, who's my friend anymore, right? I've been in so many places. So, um, and then I want to, I want to connect this a little bit to, to your chapter about mental health, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I mean, I don't know a lot about it, but I, Uh, just from your experience, your vantage point, like how did uh, seeing a, a counselor or a, uh, a person to help you out, how did it help you? And, and maybe why were you in that state of uh, mental health um, issues? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I do think that like um, it moving, like you said, and going to a whole new place and trying to start over can be very challenging. And I think sometimes it can be stressful beyond a way that we even realize. And I think that's kind of what happened for us. Um, we moved from Florida to Austin to New York to Memphis, um, and eventually back to Florida within like the span of six, seven years. And it's a lot of moving and it's a lot of having to start over. Um, and I think that that just got a little too much for my brain to do that and just being like, so when we moved to Memphis, I think my brain was like, I don't want to do this again. Like, I don't want to have to start to make a new community and like kind of, you know, figure all this out again. And my body just kind of fell apart. Um, and it was at that time too, like I had never, like I, well, I was diagnosed with like depression, anxiety in Austin a few years before. And I was like, fine, whatever. But it got bad in Memphis after that move. And that was the time I was like, I don't want to do this by myself anymore. And I, I need to talk to somebody and I never had. Um, and I ended up doing it in Memphis and like, it was the most life changing thing. And I wrote on an Instagram post lately, like, I'm so glad that I had the courage to talk to somebody. And my friend commented, she's like, I love that you said courage, because it's true. It's like, for a lot of people, like, it feels weird, right? It's like, I'm not that, like, you know, sick or like, whatever. But like, sometimes you just are. And sometimes you just need a little bit of support and help. And so like, That's why, again, like I'm so open about it because like if there's people who are out there who feel like they are really struggling and they don't, you know, they have no hope, like there is hope. You just got to take some steps that might feel a little bit awkward at first, like talking to someone or, you know, going to a doctor for medicine. But Memphis was when I really decided to do that, um, quite frankly, too, because I wanted to start having a family and I wanted to become the best version of myself for my future kids, too. So that's mm -hmm. just that season where we kind of like sometimes – Um, you can kind of like shelve trauma and hurt and things for a long time through your 20s and 30s because there's so much happening, right? Like you're moving, you're getting married, you're like doing job stuff. But it was kind of like a moment of stillness where like I was forced to face my inside mess. Um, and, I, and I'm glad that I did. And it, it changed me for the better forever. So, mm -hmm. Well, that's so good and so helpful. And... I mean, just an invitation for, for people to, 
uh, not take that for granted or even if they look at, at signs of, of you no know, anxiety or depression or things like that, like you no know, pay attention and don't feel, I mean, like you said, you know, have courage to, yeah. to ask for help. I think that's, that's super important. I love in your book, you have this phrase and it's about coming back to Minnesota, I think, but uh, I think it's super inspirational and I'm just going to read it right now. It says, leaving where you are from can teach you so much about who you are. Sometimes going back can do the same and give you a greater clarity about who you are moving forward. I love this. And especially, you know, as, as I read your story and so many people right now in the, in nowadays in this world are, I mean, as humans, we travel so much. I, I mean, I'm a person of, I, I've stayed here. I love Costa Mesa. I don't travel a lot. I, I like to go places around here. But I know that's not, no, I'm not the, the typical guy. You know, for the most part, people love to travel even, uh, you know, with their entire families. You know, they move from place to place because of job opportunities or career changes and things like that. Um, and I love this, this phrase about coming back home. So what have you learned? What did you learn coming back from that, that taught you or gave you more clarity about where you needed to be in the future? Yeah, I think that, um, so I grew up in like a suburb in Minnesota and I just kind of felt like it never fit my soul and my personality. I always was just like bored, to be honest. I was like, I don't know. And so that's why like for college, I was like, I wanted to get out. I wanted to go to Florida, like, you know, and ever since then I've been like hopping all over the country. Um, but I think that what happened was I went to Austin, Texas, and I just saw, like, the, Texas is so rich in culture, right? Like, they have just, like, the food, like, the traditions, like, they're Texas through and through, and I was, like, that's awesome. I wish I had that for myself, um, and so there was a point where, like, I went back to Minnesota, and we had, like, a really calm, nice summer there, and I kind of just tried to seek that out, and I kind of found it. Like, sometimes, like, you can appreciate where you're from, but it takes a while. You have to leave, right? You have to leave and then kind of come back and reflect, and to see it more clearly. Um, and I think the main lesson for me in that was like, I still like, I love Minnesota, but I don't want to live there again. I just don't. And I think that's okay. But some people do. Some people are like, I am born here. I will grow up here. I will die here. And that's awesome. And I think the main thing that I want people to realize is like, just listen to that. Like if I would have stayed in Minnesota my whole life and not, you know, want it, you know, just, I don't know, like, I would have, like, suppressed something within me that I felt like I needed to, to go other cities and see other things and meet new kinds of people. Um, so just, like, if you have that, like, itch, you know what I mean? Just, like, really think about it and pray for it, because maybe you are supposed to go somewhere, even if it's scary, right? Because it's not easy. It's easier just to stay in one spot. Um, but I, that just wasn't what I felt called to. So I'm glad that I did that. But also, too, like, I'm glad to be, you know, from the Midwest, I guess. And just I kind of like love going back and wearing flannels and putting on my Minnesota accent and going in the woods and all that, too. So I think the main thing is like just not letting fear stop you from where you feel like you're supposed to go, even if like you're comfortable where you are. But like you feel like it's not quite, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. Just just listen to that. You know, wow, that's good. Love it. Well, thank you so much advice and so much, I mean, um, uh, stories in this book that people can relate to in these stages of your life. And I would say, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the one about, I think, uh, a pink thong sticking out or something. <laughs> You have to say it. Hey, it's the name of the chapter. It's the name of the chapter. I'm going to skip that one, and I want to go to this other one. That one just that's seemed like That's a little like teaser, though, if anybody wants to know. I know. So <laughs> that's a chapter about being really embarrassed, and sometimes it happens. But Yeah, yeah. that's fun. So um, this chapter that, I mean, uh, it's heavy, but... You know, now you're in, you, you have this, this many you know, transitions in your life. And like you were saying, you know, I wanted to start a family at some point. And, and in one of the chapters, you know, you, you can narrate a little bit of your story with a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for people that are, I, I mean, I, I, I have so many friends, even my wife, you know, at, at some point, you know, mm -hmm. we had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have three kids, but for people that sometimes it's their first kid that's, that they're so illusioned about, oh, you know, finally here it is. And then something like that happens. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit of what were you feeling in those moments when, you know, you're finding out, you know, the, the, 
greatest joy of your life and then uh it's gone it's gone yeah and that i mean that's exactly what it is it's like the moment you realize that you get you're pregnant that you guys start, you start planning right you're like oh maybe their birthday will be this day or like maybe we'll name them this or it'll be a boy or a girl and like there's so much like expectation of what's to come and for to have that suddenly be taken from you is it's like a very specific and strange but like cool thing right it just is and it's 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 hard and it's grief that like you never know until you go through it right like you can say like oh miscarriages it happens all the time but when that baby is literally not there anymore it's like you feel an absence of something and it was it just took me by surprise and so the reason that I talk about it in the book is because like you said like so many people so many people have gone through it um and I'm and like when in that moment when we were going through it and literally I was being like ushered out the back of the doctor's office because I was bawling my eyes out like I felt like we were the only ones like you know what I mean like you just you can just feel so alone in that moment and it's just but then like after I would start talking to people like you know my small group right whatever they're like oh yeah that happened to us that happened to us too so I'm just gonna like my job is just to kind of contribute to that conversation if it's helpful to anybody else that like it's really, really hard. Um, and again, like, we don't really know why these things happen, but I don't know. Like, I just think that it's important to be open about it because it is something that so many people are grieving that we don't even realize. Right. Cause it's very easy mm -hmm. to kind of hide that grief. Um, but it's, it's a very real grief. It really is. So I just wanted to kind of be honest about it in case it could help anybody else going through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so helpful. And I mean, at some point, Uh, th that's why I mean the book is 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 amazing because you go from something as tragic and and you no know, sorrowful mm -hmm. as you no know, not having a baby to you grew a mustache but even <laughs> even for a woman I would think like what the heck you know like if you're a woman and you're thinking like you know these seasons of your life and mm -hmm. hey I'm trying to 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 have a baby and what uh -huh. you end up getting is a mustache. I mean, okay. some I'm I'm sure so many women can relate to like, hey, that's not at all what I was expecting. And even in a pregnancy, how you know sometimes you lose hair or your nails Absolutely. become you know, different and things like that. Tell me yeah. a little bit about your experience with you know, growing a mustache. I know, right? So I know, and I just because I really like it was like that was my first pregnancy with with his first baby that we lost, and like even from the moment you're pregnant, it's just it opens up your eyes that like your body is out of your control in that moment. Like you can't control what's happening to you, um, whether, you know, whether the baby's going to live or not, like that's at a very basic level, but then so many other things too. And it becomes really hard to like, I don't know, come to terms with that now. Like I've had two kids. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like my body's cool. I don't care. Like, but it, like in the early it's, it's hard, like all these changes. So yeah, we lost the baby. And then like my hormones went bonkers and I like had this like weird shadow Um, and it was so ridiculous. And like, I, of course was so upset, but the point of that story is too, it's like, sometimes life is so crazy and so out of your control and it gets hard, but like, and there's nothing you can do to change it. So we just kind of laughed at it. Right. Like me and my husband made a lot of jokes about it and just like holding on to the hope that one day things would work out. Um, but we just made jokes in the meantime about my mustache face and it eventually did go away. It's like some weird hormonal thing, but I don't know, like, like you said, there is that in the book, like talking about really deep things, but then really funny things. But I feel like in life, like sometimes you need that humor, right, to balance. And so I just, and that's how I like live my life and kind of like process things with my friends and with my family. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring that to people too, because sometimes I think even in really difficult situations, it's okay to laugh a little bit. Um, if it just it just helps if even for a moment so mm -hmm. yeah humor is it's so good it breaks down even like internal barriers that maybe you don't know they're there until you're like okay I need to laugh at it once you do it just kind of breaks up and I mean and eventually you ended up having a kid right like you how many kids do you have right now do, we have the two one? now but two? only okay. talk about my first my daughter Sunny in the book yeah Sunny yeah um, so I want to I want to let people know, I don't know how much you agree, but we'll, we'll find out. But people need to know that kids are different than pets. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Very different than pets. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, um, my next book that I'm working on now is going to talk a lot more about like parenting and the challenges that brings because, and the theme of that book is going to be like, 
it stretches you in a way that you didn't even know possible, right? Like, Mm -hmm. but it's at the same time, so, so good. And I know people always say that it's like the hardest job and the best job. And it's, that's one of those cliches, but it's true. Like I, my kids are everything to me, but also like they're so hard and so challenging. So I think that it's just kind of like finding the joy in those hard moments is sometimes all you can do. Um, but yeah, they're definitely like pets. And I love that you said it because we actually at this moment have 20 pets. We bought a farm. We like, I know we have like all these pets, but like we have goats and chickens and a mini pony and pigs. And like my husband and I go to the pets to get away from the kids. We're like, <laughs> like I'm going to go feed these goats for a minute because like they don't ask for snacks. Like, you know what I mean? So you were right. It's not the same as having pets. My pets are sometimes a reprieve from my children. So, oh, wow. <laughs> you know. Oh, that's so fun. Well, mm-hmm. Katie, this is uh, this has been a great conversation. I think it's it's super helpful for people that are are going through those uh, phases in life where you know things have panned out or are panning out, or you don't even know how they're gonna pan out. But it's true, you know. And I think I love your your perspective on it and always like having this it it seems to me like in in the background there's always been like this faith component to you know all these changes in your life and decision making and you know career change and moving you know from town to town so i admire you for that and even the inspiration that you bring to people as they read the book so for that i want to rate this book with an emoji Okay. Does that sound good? So right now people are going to see the emoji that we have chosen for the Gap Decade. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Inspired emoji. You get an inspired emoji for your book. How do you feel about that? I feel so grateful. Thank you. The best honor I've had today. Yes, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm happy. Um, Katie, would you, you know where do you want to point people to to find out more about your writing, about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is available on Amazon. It's actually in like Barnes and Nobles across the country. It's anywhere bookstores are sold, which is awesome. But you can um, go to my website, katieschnack, S-C-H-N-A-C-K dot com. And that's my handles on social as well. Um, yeah, so just follow along. I would love to connect with you and I just appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie, for being on the show. And my friends, if you're watching right now or listening, whatever, we have new merch at christianpodcast.com. Go check it out. I'm wearing right now the, the blasphemous emoji. Uh, hat so look at it you know we have five emojis we have merchandise that you can look at and that's a great way to support the show so we'll see you guys on the next one